بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم السلام علیکم اینڈ ویلکم ٹو نیوز روم آمی ہوسٹ رما خالد بٹ ٹوڈے از سیونتھ آف نومبر ٹوینٹی ٹوینٹی فور اینڈ دیز آر دا اسٹوریز دیٹ وی ول بی ڈیسائفرنگ ڈیورنگ دا کورس آف آر شو ول بگن لیڈیز اینڈ جنٹل مین ود دا گیمٹ آف ٹائز بٹوین دا یونائٹڈ اسٹیٹس اینڈ پاکستان ناؤ دیٹ نیو پریزیڈنٹ ڈونلڈ ٹرمپ ہیز کم ان دا فورے پاکستان لکس فارورڈ ٹو نیو چیپٹر آف ریلیشنس بٹوین دا ٹو کنٹریز دس ہیز آلسو بین انسیٹیڈ ان دا اسٹیٹمنٹ دیٹ واز پوسٹیڈ آن لائن بائی آور پرائم منسٹر شہباز شریف as well as other leaders the fact is that the relationship between parks and the u.s has always been uh, there since uh, since the last few decades and uh, there are different realms of that uh, relationship that maybe could be strengthened in this new era what and how could that take place is what we will be discussing in our first segment our second story ladies and gentlemen concerns the middle east situation today is day 397 of the conflict between gaza and israel the number of casualties still continues to increase the number of injured continues to increase the situation as far as health or a uh, human uh, element of the whole situation is concerned cons- continues to uh, deteriorate with every passing day people are moving towards a state of famine there is a dearth of water of food of basic health facilities and of basic necessities as such also uh, in lebanon uh, the con- uh, you know uh, the whole assault by israeli troops continues there have been bombardments near the uh, beirut airport as well and uh, the number of migrations that are occurring in lebanon has also crossed hundreds of thousands uh, this said a lot of questions are also emanating whether uh, Be- beirut or lebanon is going to be another gaza we'll be discussing that in our second segment then we are going to discuss about uh, a swiss burqa ban ladies and gentlemen that is coming into effect from the year uh, 2025 from the 1st of january 2025 in fact this is a ban on facial coverings in public spaces which is commonly known as the burqa ban that will come into effect there are different modalities to it on where it uh, it uh, is um, uh, you know uh, it can be applied or where it can not be applied or there's some kind of relaxation that will be highlighting that finally we'll be talking about pakistan that has set a new world record as far as the largest human flag is concerned and this was recently done uh, by the students of the army public school lahore who participated in the formation of this flag let's begin with our uh, you know uh, st- show for today we'll begin with the tangent of relations between uh, pakistan and the united states of america we've been joined by two guests one from the us and one from pakistan in the studios we've been joined by dr zia shamsi is a foreign affairs expert dr sab thank you very much to have joined us and on line we've been joined by uh, mark myrowitz he's a political analyst from the us mark good to see you after a long time let's begin uh, with you dr zia shamsi uh, our prime minister as well as other uh, leaders uh, uh, you know felicitated donald trump when he uh, when he of course uh, became victorious and is all set to become the 47th president of the united states of america i'd like to uh, you know quote what our prime minister said on, which was posted on x he said congratulations to the president elect donald trump on his historic victory for a second term and that he looked forward to working closely with the incoming administration to further strengthen and broaden the park us partnership how do you feel this partnership could further be broadened yeah, bismillah rahman rahim thank you very much uh, our very pertinent subject and uh, um, pakistan's uh, leadership did the right thing that uh, they immediately uh, sent a message of uh, congratulations uh, this is what the norm is uh, because uh, president trump has been elected uh, in a landslide victory which is a historical comeback of political history of the US. He is only the second person uh, in US history uh, who will be president uh, after a gap of another four years. And uh, he has been able to won all the swing states which were under discussion for last so many months. So people have spoken and uh, we respect the opinion of the people. President Trump, um, had a very cordial relationship with Pakistan in, it, in his first term. Um, I see him as an anti-war uh, person and uh, he's a businessman. So he doesn't believe in wars and conflicts um, because he wants to attract investment in his country and improve the economy of the country. As we speak today, we know that America is highly indebted and uh, highly debted and uh, 
at least every American at this time is under debt of 160,000 US dollars. So that was his task case. And if you look at his team, um, you will notice that he's serious in improving the economy. Elon Musk, and uh, then on the health side, uh, RFK Jr. Uh, so um, he has already lined up his priorities. So Pakistan at this time, it's very important that we move quickly and swiftly and send good messages to Washington so that Trump feels that what has happened in the past in Afghanistan for the last two, two decades, Pakistan is on board with us to improve the strategic partnership that Pakistan also needs. And America also needs. So um, I think leadership has done the right thing, uh, sending the right messages. And uh, this uh, will go very positively with the Trump uh, incoming administration. Why? Because they have a very good system. Um, a proper handing over, taking over will take place over the next two months. So he is going to be sewn in on 20th January 25. And this is a transition period. So if we can move swiftly, uh, as we mm. have done, mm. we, we have uh, started off very well, um, that uh, the signal has, right uh, kind of signal has gone in, that within these two months, we should be able to have enough lobbying by the diaspora plus the embassy uh, in uh, DC to make Trump comfortable that Pakistan leadership is on our side all right so i think leadership has started off on the right footing all right all right we start off on the right foot mark uh, we couldn't get a hold of you during the election so of course i'm going to ask you some election related uh, questions as well because now that we have you mark uh, first of all congratulations you have a new president elect the 47th president of the united states of america mr donald trump who uh, as you we all know dodged two assassination attempts and said during his victory speech that many people told him that God spared my life for a reason and that that task before us will not be easy. He also spoke of attempting to unify the divided country. He said it's time to put divisions of the past behind us. Whether it be nationally or internationally, how important do you feel this statement is to put divisions of the past behind and move forward towards an era of cohesion, whether it be nationally, regionally or globally? Uh, this is very important, but it's not just on the part of Trump, but it's also the Democrats. What we're seeing from the Democrats is lots of divisive statements, problematic statements. We have Senator Elizabeth Warren talking about grief. Harris herself in her concession speech talks about a dark time coming. I have friends who are Democrats, and they're all upset about this. We got to get together here. I totally agree with your point. The problem in this country is that the Democrats didn't understand Trump. They didn't understand what he was about. They misconstrued the people who supported him. And if they continue to remain clueless and confused, we're going to have a problem in this country. If what they're thinking about is how to fight back, and this is exactly Harris's theme in her concession, we can, we, when we fight, we win, but sometimes we lose, but we're going to keep fighting. I don't think in all candor that that's a statesmanlike st statement. The statesmanlike statement is we got to all get together, we got to support President Trump. As you say, this is a president who has been two assassination attempts, has been indicted, convicted, impeached twice. They tried to kick him off the ballot. And the New York Times today headline is as follows, from outcast to felon to president. Now, is that a message about bringing people together? Or is that a message of continuing the vilification of Trump, which Harris and Wolves called a fascist, compared him to Hitler? They've got to stop that so we can all sit back get together and deal with what Dr. Shamsi talked about, which is our debt, our economic problems, and put a united front behind dealing with our issues and not keep hurling invectives at one another. I agree with you on that. I think the world and the U.S. and any other country, I feel, needs more of cohesion than of division. And this is the time 
and maybe with the outstanding uh, mandate that uh, Donald Trump has come with, maybe he would be the you know harbor or harbinger of change for the society in the U.S., for the U.S. and for its relations with countries, including that with Pakistan. I'll go now to my other guest, and then I'll re revert back to you. What needs to be done in your point of view, Dr. Zia Shamsi, from both the sides, from the U.S. and from Pakistan, in order to improve relations? You said, of yeah. course, you have, we have made the right first step. We have, uh, you know, uh, 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 congratulated Donald Trump at the right time. We have talked positively. What now? What should we move forward? So you've talked about lobbying as well. What else? Yeah, I, I, I'll come to that. If you allow me, I'll Please. just go back to what Mark said. Okay. Uh, because uh, analyzing uh, U.S. elections were very important. I've been, um, by the grace of Allah, correct on at least two accounts in the last two years. Number one, I've been saying uh, that uh, President Biden will not seek a re-election. The reason was, uh, my focus was on his health issues, mm -hmm. not otherwise. Number one, it has proven correct. Number two, Kamala was a very, very weak candidate. Why? Because she did not come through the system, democratic mm. system. Mm -hmm. She did not go through the primaries and, and the um, caucuses, etc. And only 117 days to lobby uh, or to do the campaigning. Whereas President Trump is campaigning for the last nine years actually. Mm -hmm. His term before that and last four mm. years also. And you can have observations on his personality, his personal life or anything. But as far as leadership is concerned, he meets mm. all the uh, attributes, mm. resilience, mm. courage, mm. bold, isn't it? Yes. And takes initiative. Mm. He is a multi-millionaire but talks of the poor people. Mm. That's what is appealed. Mm. Kamala um, actually relied upon the uh, celebrities, hmm. yes, Americans like celebrities, hmm. but they don't like the ce mm, celebrities I, this asking I, them for the yes, because I think the, that is the the thing. The thing is that appeal to people yeah. is the people power yes. of Donald Trump, yes. and that is why people voted for him. It is a democracy. It is what people do. Absolutely. People vote for the candidate that they want, and they Absolutely. have voted for Trump because they also wanted to vote for a change. Uh, from the current situation that the U.S. was embroiled in. And I'll go Absolutely. back to Mark as far as that situation is concerned. Economy, a lot of people and analysts say, was the main reason behind or one of the major reasons behind the resounding uh, way in which Donald Trump has uh, you know, uh, returned to power. Uh, Donald Trump has also talked about a lot of things when he, when he talks of the economy. He talks about slashing the corporate rate tax out, uh, you know, cut the government spending, impose massive tariffs of foreign-made goods and make the U.S. the world's largest energy producer. How important is the implementation of these pledges now and what more needs to be done on the economic front by the new Donald Trump regime? First of all, let me comment on the point that was made before, which is very important about democracy. The Democrats branded Trump as a threat to democracy. Now, isn't it ironic that he won a landslide election, not only in the electoral vote, but in the popular vote. And the Senate has turned Republican and the House will turn Republican. The problem is that democracy is in threat, but not from the Republicans and not from Trump. It's from the Democrats. And I want to say one thing about Bernie Sanders, because I don't agree with him on anything, but he said Today or yesterday, the Democrats have abandoned the working class. And I think this is the point that was made about working people, regular people. The Democrats called the Trump supporters deplorables. That was Hillary. They called them garbage. That was Biden. And I assure you, there are many college-educated and very smart people and working class people across all races, all economic classes that supported Trump in a truly democratic election. On the economy, note the Dow Jones Industrial Average went up 1,500 points when Trump was elected. Does that tell you something about the hope for the economy and a corporate tax rate and a tax rate and cutting taxes? This is the whole idea behind the election, inflation, prices, all of that. But what really is the key is that Harris's campaign was purely 
anti-Trump. Trump is terrible. Trump is a threat. And even the Democrats are continuing that today after they lost the election. And that was a loser. That was a loser because they don't understand or grasp the average American and how they think and what they care about. Here's a good example. Biden issued an order to forgive the student loans for millions of students, which increased the debt, which the, our, our distinguished guest was talking about, by an enormous amount. Bidenomics, all of this was a loser. In fact, the court knocked it down. So the Democrats, Biden, first of all, Biden was compromised. They put in Harris, they put in Harris without elections in a non-democratic fashion, an anti-democratic fashion. They anointed her for 107 days, and she was supposed to fill the, the, the position of a president of the United States. And I agree wholeheartedly with your distinguished guest that she was a very weak candidate. And I think the average American, whether college educated, non-college educated, and all races, all genders across, could see that Kamala Harris was not fit or prepared to be a president of the United States. Trump has been president. And yes, he says a lot of things and does a lot of things that are out there. But I don't think, if you look at his actual term, I think he made a lot of successes, even in foreign policy. And Biden's foreign policy has been a disaster. We have wars in Europe. We have war in Middle East, crisis around the world. This is Biden, a fading candidate, and Harris coming in, and she was going to come in and buttress and fix the world. This was complete delusion. By the way, last point, today in the New York Times, Brett Stephens, who is quite conservative, actually he w voted for Harris, called the Democratic Party the party of priggishness, pontification, and pomposity. What does that mean? Elites who are smug and look down on the working people which your distinguished guest spoke about. Look down on the average American. They want to look to celebrities to President Obama to tell them how they should vote. And the average American said, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to go with something different and try to get a success story for the future. And I think I'm hopeful. But the Democrats have to come on board and stop the invectives and stop the grief and just come on board and work together. That's how I All right. All right. Let's stay online with us. Dr. Zia, uh, you know, uh, you've talked about uh, the anti-war statements that Donald Trump has made. We are all also looking forward to what foreign policy brief uh, the Trump administration is going to put forward as far as uh, how the U.S. is going to move after January 2025. I'd like to refer again to uh, Pakistan, where the chairperson of Pe Pakistan People's Party, Bilawal Bhutto Zardari, when he uh, felicitates Donald Trump online. He uh, it talks about his resounding victory and he terms the Republicans' win and mandate as anti-war. He says, we hope the new administration will prioritize peace and help end the cycle of perpetual global conflict. Now, Trump also, when he had addressed his victory speech, said that I am not going to start a war, I am going to stop wars. How much of hope is now tied to Donald Trump prioritizing peace and help end the cycle of conflict. Do you feel Trump can use or will use this mandate to stop wars? Yeah, very, very important. Um, look, American people have given him the mandate to stop wars. Hmm. Because the wars of the past 21st century wars, the, all wars have been in which US was actively involved. Hmm. Afghan war, Iraq war, etc. And that is why um, they, the economy went down, number one. Number two, during this period, when America was so busy in actual wars, mm -hmm. China was quietly rising. And now if anybody says China is rising, I don't mm -hmm. agree because mm -hmm. China has already risen. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now all Donald Trump needs to do now is to immediately immediately launch his peace, peace plan, stop wars everywhere in Europe as well as Middle East. Mm. And you would notice that for the Middle East wars, mm. especially he went to Michigan where there are a lot of Arabs and Muslims and they all endorsed him. Yes, and two they, mayors have endorsed yes, him. 
and they sought promise from him mm. that you will help us stop genocide in Gaza. Mm. And he said, yes, I will. Mm. And about Ukraine war, he has already said that on day one, I will stop the war. Mm. How, how would he stop the war? Mm. He would stop funding. Mm. And he has been very vocal about uh, funding to Zelensky. Mm. So, we have to keep uh, our hopes alive. Exactly. Because, I think this is the time where, when our hopes are alive. Because, because of this. where the Biden administration, mm. which is the worst administration of 21st century and perhaps prior also, has taken the world close to World War III. We this are is what Donald Trump also said. We are uh, already in, in 2.5. We are already at World War 2.5, where 40 mm. percent world's population okay. is facing either wars or mm. conflict. Mm. So, if if Trump does not stop here, mm. we will enter into World War Three. Mm. So uh, he has no choice. He has to fulfill his promises mm. because Americans have voted him mm. to do this job, mm. and the rest of the world is hoping. Okay. That he should do this. Okay, so let's let's see. A man of his word, Donald Trump. Mark, coming to you. Uh, we are all looking forward to the po foreign policy uh, objectives that the Trump administration and Donald Trump will be putting forward. Uh, what is going? What where America is going to move? But uh, looking at his anti-war stance that he has reiterated at many a times, also in his victory speech, what happens to the different conflicts that are currently, you know? engaging so many countries in the West and are creating an aura of perpetual global conflict. Will Donald Trump be able to take the world to a new stage? Well, so first of all, to the point about the economy and war, I think normally uh, the economy actually, terrible to say it, but the economy tends to go up during a war, uh, not down. But notwithstanding that, um, look, what Trump did in order to avoid war, if you wish, is to use what I would call the force of threat. I mean, he says to Kim Jong-un, you know, my button is bigger than your button. And he says, I'm going to end all the wars and all that. And, and it's interesting that um, many of the world leaders have already reached out to him at this time. So what is the real, what is the real solution here? So for example, in the Middle East, the real solution is to embark again on the policy which the United States had towards Iran. As far as Ukraine, hard to know how that's going to play out. He says he's going to solve it right away. I, I just don't know. It's the art of the deal. How do you solve the Ukraine crisis? So, yes, that's a, it's, it's the way he operates is by force of threat. He says to NATO, you know, NATO powers, if you don't pay up your amount, I won't defend you if you're attacked. Does he really mean that? On Taiwan, if Taiwan were attacked, does it really mean that he wouldn't come to the defense of Taiwan. So there are a lot of things here that he says that are done more for the purpose of pressure, if you will, in order to get a result. And you do see the whole temperament of many of the world leaders. I think the statement that was made or the letter that uh, Xi Jinping sent, I want to be cooperative with you and work with you. That is a very, I think, helpful start to what is hopefully going to be a more uh, workable, competitive, relationship where we have uh, no conflict in, in Asia, in Europe, in the Middle East. But, you know, it's a big, big job. And I wanted to add one important point to keep in mind. The president is not the only uh, institution in our American system that decides on foreign policy. You have the House, which appropriates funds. You have the Senate, which is also a key element in foreign policy. Congress very often comes on board with the president on foreign policy when the United States is attacked, when the United States is under threat. But the president has to work with the Congress. And Trump does have to learn to work with his leaders in Congress, in the Senate and the House, even if the Republicans take all three houses. Interestingly enough, as a final point on this, is that there was an article in Foreign Affairs magazine by Jake Sullivan, who was Biden's advisor, that wrote at one point, he wrote, our foreign policy is so good, we have no problems in the Middle East. And then came the October 7th crisis and actually had to rewrite the article and send it into Foreign Affairs magazine because it was so totally wrong. So the other point there is you have to be attuned to what's going on in the world and be able to deal with the problems as they develop.
All right. Thank you very much, Mark, to have joined us, to have given us your point of view as far as uh, uh, the new uh, incoming administration is concerned and how uh, the statements or the pledges made by uh, the president-elect Donald Trump will uh, go a long mile ahead in order to rectify the internal and external situation uh, of the United States of America as well as we are also looking forward to a lot of peace, stability, cohesion and working together uh, of all the different countries of the world. Isn't, wouldn't it be a good place uh, to, you know, when all countries move together uh, in their own spheres, but move together and uh, there is less and less of conflict. Thank you very much again, Mark, to have joined us. And uh, of course, let's move now to our second segment and that concerns uh, the Middle East, uh, day 397 of the Israel-Palestine conflict. Lebanon is not far behind because the number of casualties are also increasing. So is the bombardment of Lebanon by the Israeli forces. Uh, no peace deal, uh, uh, despite the fact that there, was, uh, there are talks going on in Egypt. There is nothing concrete as of yet. We have been joined uh, by Dr. Haisam Abu Said. Uh, he joins us from the IHRC uh, in uh, Geneva and also we continue to be joined by Dr. Zia Shamsi who is a foreign affairs expert to discuss uh, uh, the Palestine conflict. We will begin with you Dr. Zia and I will begin with what Pakistan said. Very recently at the UN, Pakistan has condemned Israel's attempt to dismantle UNRWA. This is a decision that the uh, Israelis have taken now officially and have also intimated the United Nations. Uh, the, the acting permanent representative of Pakistan uh, also demanded that the demonization, demonetization and uh, delegitimization of UNRWA be stopped here forth. He uh, also said by targeting United Nations relief agencies for Palestinian uh, refugees, Israel not only obstructs humanitarian assistance but also threatens the collective effort to uphold the Palestinian people's identity. My question is how important has been the Pakistani voice as far as the Palestinian cause or this conflict is concerned? And also, in this case, for UNRWA, will it ring on ears or will it ring on deaf ears? Yeah, unfortunately, we have not uh, been that powerful as we have been in the past, as far as the UMA is concerned. For UNRWA, every country should raise a voice, not only Pakistan. Why? Because it is a relief agency. Hmm. And Israel has adopted this policy of create fear mm. in the hearts and minds of the supporters of the Palestinians. Mm. That is what they are doing since October 7, mm. when they started to retaliate on this uh, Hamas action. Mm. And unfortunately, we have all cowed down. In fact, if an enemy is on the offensive, and if you remain on the defensive for a very long time, mm. then he keeps on gaining the momentum. And that is what Israel has gotten. Israel has gotten the momentum and has been supported fully by the Biden administration and the other Western powers. And that is why it keeps on expanding the wings. Mm. I initially, it was only Gaza, then became the West Bank, then it has become uh, Lebanon, South Lebanon, then it has become Iran, then it is Yemen, Yemen and Syria. Yemen well. and Syria. Mm. So, e e they will keep on expanding their wings because they notice that there is nobody to cut their wings. Mm. Unless Umma gets together mm. and mobilizes and highlights the genocidal acts that Israel is committing mm. for the last 379 days, as mm. you said they will not stop. Okay. And as Mark said that let Trump walk in first mm. and let us see what kind of briefing he gets. All right. Because he, he may have made promises during the elections, mm. but when he gets into the office mm. and he has something on the table, mm. we know the history uh, of uh, fake folders presented to President Bush for Iraq war. Mm. So, we do not know what kind of folder will be placed in front of uh, President Trump when he walks in on 20th January. So, we have to do it ourselves. Diplomacy never sleeps. So, we keep raising voice mm. for UNRWA, for the people, for 
for the children, for the hospitals, for the schools, for the women, for the old, every on every forum. We should not wait that OIC will be formed and we will have a conference mm. or a group will be formed. We should individually keep on raising our voices as we Continuously. Mm. We, we mm. have seen what social media mm. has done uh, in US elections. Mm. We as Pakistanis mm. and this uh, Generation Z who keep playing uh, with the uh, cell phone all the mm. time mm. should in my opinion should keep on tweeting, keep no. on become more proactive more as far as proactive on the social media mm. and keep highlighting All right. that there are atrocities being committed mm. against mm. the unarmed and non-combatants. All right. Dr. Haisam Busai, thank you very much to have joined us and welcome to Newsroom. The United Nations Humanitarian Chief Joyce Msuya warns that Palestinian civilians held under near total brutal siege by Israeli forces in northern Gaza are starving while the world watches. Also, the WFP, the World Food Programme, has warned that the humanitarian situation in Gaza could soon escalate into famine. We all know that food is not properly arriving to the people uh, in Gaza. They, are, uh, uh, they don't have the basic facilities uh, to uh, sustain themselves, food, water, medicine, health facilities, and, uh, and what not. And on top of that, they are being bombarded by Israel non-stop. They are being told to displace from one area to the other and then back to the area that has completely been destroyed. Hospitals have been destroyed, educational institutions are destroyed, and uh, the list goes on and on. What happens to the Palestinians now? When will this stop? Yes, good afternoon to you and the audience and to your guest. <clears throat> well, what Israel is doing today, I mean, it's not something new. It is, uh, it's being repeated since 2006. And uh, exactly uh, the atrocities of the uh, war that is being conducted by Israel is also being repeated. But this time, they took it a little bit heavy because of the uh, preparation, I believe, of the resistance in Lebanon and because of the uh, circumstances that was in 2006 during the 2006 July war uh, between uh, uh, Israel and Lebanon and where they were defeated according to the news and according to the crown that came with a good results for the resistance in Lebanon at the time. So I believe Israel is going to push this issue further and higher than it was before because they cannot uh, hold another defeat on the internal side. Because I, I believe, as your guest was saying, that there's a lot of promises that was made by the government to the Israeli people. And they assured them that this war with, uh, started with Gaza and then later on with Lebanon will create a certain uh, assurance to the Israelis and a certain security area for them so that they can continue their lives as it was uh, uh, promised at the beginning of the establishment of uh, Israel as a state. So uh, the, the situation today on the humanitarian aspect is going worse because of their uh, policies. Uh, this policy, uh, this starvation policy that they are exercising today in Gaza, and they are trying also to surround Lebanon from all sides by the air and by uh, also trying to filtrate through Syria and to turn around the Lebanese resistance is also to create a certain blockage so that they can do what they are doing today uh, in Gaza. But I believe that uh, the ground uh, created a different outcome than it was uh, in 2000 or let's say the expectation of the army uh, after the Gaza war or after a year from the Gaza war, I can say that uh, the resistance was uh, more stubborn, uh, they are more prepared, and the uh, border was more secured from the Lebanese side. And this is something that affects all the leaders in Israel, whether they are militaries or uh, politicians, because they are being stuck in the, on the border, and they have to come out with something to deliver to the Israeli community. All right. Uh, Dr. Zia, uh, coming to you, uh, I'd just like to you know, uh, 
enumerate the casualties, 43,391 killed since the 7th of October and 102,347 injured. And this is just a superficial number because the real numbers will come whenever the war ends. And as far as the Lancet report is concerned, it will even exceed 180,000, those who have been killed in this war in Palestine alone. Uh, hasn't this situation become the direst one of this century? Uh, and uh, it is being perpetuated by those people who have themselves been the victim post the Second World War. What kind of syndrome do you, you know, take this as? Is there more than what meets the eye? Or is it just uh, an occupation of these territories, come what may, till the last man stands? Yeah, as I said before also, the 21st century wars have been deadly. I mean, we were promised uh, when uh, the, at the turn of the century, we were promised uh, by the only superpower, the US, that uh, we have successfully defeated communism and now US is the sole superpower. There is uh, unipolarity in the international system and our values are life, liberty, freedom, love, everything. So, due to information technology revolution, the life is going to be very rosy and very easy. Unfortunately, 9-11 happened and I always say it was a game changer. Everything changed and the number of wars that have taken, plain in, taken place in 21st century within these 24 years mm. are far more deadlier than those that happened in 20th century, including the two world wars. So, the amount of support Israel is getting from the US led West mm. has made them so emboldened that they do not care about International Court of Justice or UNRWA mm. or UN Security Council or UN I mean, just imagine Biden administration had been vetoing the ceasefire mm. resolutions. Whereas ceasefire is something that whenever or wherever the war starts, the first effort of diplomacy is to achieve a ceasefire and provide food and medicine mm. and water and relief, relief goods. This is the first priority of almost everybody. I mean, whenever, I mean, we can, we have the examples, whenever Pakistan and India clashed, uh, even on the peripheries, US would play a very positive role mm -hmm. in diffusing the situation, isn't it? But when it comes to Middle East and the Israel, US role of diplomacy has been absolutely negative. Instead of creating a space for peaceful negotiations or the ceasefire or the corridor of sending the food, medicine and uh, doctors, they veto the uh, resolutions. I mean, in past uh, more than one year, like you said, 379 days, Qatar only made an effort to provide safe, safe passage hmm. for the uh, But that did not work group. in the long run as well. It I mean, that is, that, is, that is a very sad and sorry so state of affairs. It really pains me to hmm. say that uh, we are unable to do something. Unfortunate. All right. Coming to, I mean, uh, Dr. Shamsi talked about law and legislation. I'd like to talk about two legislations or laws to you, uh, Dr. Haisam Busai, that have recently passed by the Israeli parliament. First, uh, legislation allowing the government to deport family members of the so called quote unquote terrorists to Gaza and elsewhere, even if they are Israeli citizens. Secondly, also a law granting the education ministry the authority to fire without prior notice teachers who have been identified with a terrorist act. How do you view these legislations and wouldn't they be misused? Uh, you mean uh, the laws that uh, was uh, recently approved by the Israeli's uh, yes, Justice Ministry and the Parliamentary, uh, is that it? Yes, these two laws, yes. Can you hear me? Okay. okay. Dr. Heisen, can yeah, you hear not, me? Not, yeah, yeah, yeah not, okay, not too good. Okay. Hello? The two laws were the laws concerning the teachers and the laws of deporting people to Gaza, uh, even if they were Israeli citizens. I mean, I'm just asking how these laws are going to be construed or misconstrued or misused. 
Well, this goes, this goes under the uh, instructions of the Prime Minister of uh, Israel, Benjamin Netanyahu, who was since the beginning of this war, wanted to deport and to uh, transfer all Palestinians from Palestine, not only, uh, I mean, from the, at least from the ter territories of 1967. Uh, we are talking the West Bank and we are talking Gaza Strip. So he wanted to deport them ever since because they have their prop proper project okay, of expanding uh, the territory of Israel on all Palestine and not giving any part of it to the Palestinians. So they wanted to, you know, uh, uh, stop the two-state resolution. I mean, uh, Oslo 1993 uh, Accord, this is something that they were not agreed on. And I believe that uh, the prime minister at the time was scared because of that, because the Israeli communities are not with a peaceful solution. They are not with the two-state uh, solution. So what they are trying to do and creating this uh, war after the October 7, uh, because the, the weight of the war doesn't meet what happened on October 7. Okay, let's be very frank. I mean, they could respond in a different manner and not expanding all this into a world war war, if you want. Okay, because we saw the, the, the mass destruction that they created. It was not against Hamas or to extort Hamas from Gaza. But the meaning of this war was to deport all Palestinians and to kill the biggest amount of them and the rest they will be sorted out. So uh, finally they came out with a legal resolution thinking that this resolution will cover their act. But this is not true because uh, the United Nations and especially the Inquiry Committee on Gaza were very clear on that, that there is no uh, way to accept any other resolutions besides the 1967 resolution, uh, uh, I mean, accord that was uh, uh, approved by the by most of the United Nations state councils. So they are trying to bypass all these UN resolutions and creating a local resolution through the parliament saying that this is the uh, apartheid, this is the uh, the status of the uh, of the Israeli approach towards the uh, the solution, and uh, this legal uh, uh, memorandum that they created, it is against international law because first of all, it is against the what came out of the inquiry committee of uh, uh, of the United Nations at the Human Rights Council, saying that Israel is occupying. Uh, the uh, the other part of uh, Palestine, which is illegal, so they have to withdraw. And I think that this resolution is to cover all their crimes that they are committing to date. All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Haisam Boussaid, uh, talking to us from Geneva, from the IHRC, to have given us your point of view on this conflict that has the Middle East burning as we speak. Thank you very much, sir, to have joined us. Dr. Zia Shamsi, I'd like uh, your point of view as far as the situation in uh, Lebanon is concerned. Uh, Beirut has been bombed overnight, uh, 40 people have been killed, 53 wounded in aerial bombardments in eastern Lebanon, Bika Valley and Baalbek city as well. At least 3,050 people have been killed, 13,658 wounded since this war on Gaza began on the 7th of October. But the number of casualties are increasing with every passing day and so are the displacements. Is Lebanon becoming another Gaza? Yes, um, perhaps yes. Why? Because, as you said, the number of casualties are increasing. Why? Because the weapon systems are now very lethal, very precise. Mm. And as you've seen, they, they've taken out so many leaders uh, in their bunkers, mm. in their locations, in their secret locations. Because they have a very elaborate uh, intelligence network. They have uh, all the electronic uh, wherewithal where they can pinpoint the target and penetrate deep into the bunker and then explode. So that is why the casualties are more. Secondly, Israel has decided and adopted a strategy of fear and tear. Create fear and then tear them apart. Why? So that the people lose confidence in their state and in their administration that they are unable to protect them from the Israelis. And therefore, let's submit it. 
to okay. the Israelis. All right, that, that's a very important point, and we'll end on that. Thank you very much, Dr. Zia Shamsi, to have joined us all throughout the show talking about two very, very important topics. Uh, of course, the current UN administration and how it is going to move forward as far as different issues are concerned, including its relationship with Pakistan as well as the Palestinian conflict. Thank you very much to have joined us throughout the show. Kindly stay with us for a few more minutes till we end the show. Last two stories, ladies and gentlemen, the first concerns a burqa ban that is going to be implemented from the 1st of January 2025 in Switzerland. It's called burqa ban, but it's more a prohibition on facial coverings in public spaces. Now, it was uh, narrowly passed in, 20, uh, in a 2021 referendum in uh, Switzerland and of course was condemned by the Muslims associations, but it was launched by, again by the same group that organized the 2009 ban on new minarets. The ban does not apply to planes or in diplomatic or consular premises and faces may also be covered in places of worship and other sacred sites. Finally, ladies and gentlemen, Pakistan has set a new world record by making the largest human flag. This was made by the students of the Army Public School in Lahore who participated in the formation of the flag. Over 10,000 students took part in the formation of this flag. The previous uh, record has been uh, by the students in India where 7,368 students had made the flag. The new world record was established during the Lahore Youth Festival, which is now underway at the Fort Stadium in Lahore under the AGs of the Punjab government. So, of course, a huge uh, con a bundle of congratulations to the children of the Army Public School in uh, Lahore to have created this new world record. With that, ladies and gentlemen, we come to an end of today's news. And we'll see you, inshallah, tomorrow with new stories and segments that pertain to us, you and Pakistan. Stay safe. Allah Hafiz.